students, teachers, readers, as Ina pointed out, friends. I hope that covers everybody. It really is a delight to be with you here today to celebrate or to join you in celebrating the 50th anniversary of the English Department of the University of Kerala. 50 years is a long time. I mean, I, uh, I was asking Dr. Dutt how much younger than the university the department is, and she said 25 years. But when you think of 50, it's still um, an awfully long time. In 1963, Jawaharlal Nehru was prime minister. The most prominent Indian in the cabinet spoke better English than Malayalam. Uh, we had um, a nation in which um, the language rights of the mid-60s were yet to break out, where um, independence was still fresh and the, the sense of triumph over British colonial domination had not eclipsed the usefulness of English as a language of communication and indeed of national unity. As I've often pointed out, Jawaharlal Nehru discovered India in English. Uh, and so for my, to my mind, English was in fact the principal language of Indian nationalism. Even though Gandhiji encouraged every Indian to speak in his or her mother tongue, I felt that what Nehru understood and articulated so brilliantly in his writings was that a language that was equally advantageous or disadvantageous in every part of the country had that advantage of equality throughout the land that anyone's mother tongue alone could not have. In these 50 years, however, a number of things have changed for the English language in India and in Kerala. I think the first and most obvious has been the increasing assertion of what one might call both political and cultural pride in the vernaculars. This is inevitable, perhaps. Uh, it's, it's entirely understandable that this should be the case. But particularly with the emphasis by state governments and by politicians elected in the states to um, the emphasis upon having instruction in the mother tongue, English has inevitably been de-emphasized throughout the country. And so one sees that English departments that used to be extremely reputed, not just in India but worldwide, are simply not being seen in the same light today. I remember an old friend of mine, I never was a student, Professor P. Lal of Calcutta University, saying to me, but well, this is about 20 years ago, that he said, uh, everything in India gets better and worse at the same time. He said, when you were um, in, in, you know, when I first knew I was in high school in Calcutta, but he was teaching at Calcutta University, uh, he said that perhaps I would have had, uh, in my English department, he said I would have had five world-class students and 50 mediocre ones. He says, today I have 20 world-class students and 200 mediocre ones. So everything gets better and worse at the same time. Now that actually would be a, a progression, one could argue. But of course, given the increase in our nation's population, given the scale in which our country has been growing, that also means that the larger numbers he's talking about represent an ever smaller percentage of society, of our population. So is English in danger of being, of becoming more and more irrelevant? In favor of that argument is an unexpected development. And that development is that of our communications uh, and, 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 and television uh, capacity in this country. When I was a child, there was, for the most part, no television. But when television finally came, it was one channel in black and white. And that one channel would give you both programming in English and Hindi, with the result that essentially anybody who understood any English and wanted to know the news or didn't understand any Hindi and wanted to know the news, the entire nation would sit down at the same time, whatever it was, 7 p.m., 8 p.m. at night, and watch the same news in the same language. And that would, in a sense, be a force of national unity. Today, that is no longer the case. What is happening is that everyone has access in their own language, their mother tongue, to a multiplicity of choices of television channels. We have over 300 all news 24-7 channels in our country, and we also have, of course, entertainment and cinema and all sorts of other things in the other language. With the result that the national imagination has given way to a sub-linguistic, sub-regional imagination. So you can live in Kerala and never watch an English channel. You can watch a choice of nine or 11 Malayalam channels, and there are new ones coming every few months. 
Similarly, a Tamil person would only have Tamil channels. They would watch a Bengali, Bengali, Hindi, speaker Hindi, and so on. This creates a sort of linguistic fragmentation of the national sensibility, where what you are seeing increasingly is people thinking more and more parochially. It has political implications because the rise and consolidation of the regional parties in our politics is also a reflection of modern communications and the way in which our own imagination has been segmented by the availability of, of linguistic options that we understand in our own mother tongues. To my mind, this is actually uh, slightly worrying, and more than slightly worrying, because it means that increasingly uh, we are either in danger of fragmentation or we are in danger of a, a unity that becomes very tenuous and that is conducted only at a superficial level. That is that there is an elite at the top that for reasons of education or of their professional interest uh, can function in English and therefore relate to each other, but everybody else, 90% of the population, functions only within their own groups. The converse of this argument, however, is the economic globalization that we are all living in since the late 90s, where increasingly it is no longer possible to think only in terms of a life sequestered by your geographical or linguistic reality. That as India progresses and grows, as there are more educated people, even educated in their own mother tongues perhaps, that they find themselves in a job market and in an economic environment in which they have to relate to people of other linguistic backgrounds and therefore the need for a linked language becomes all the more intense. So you've got both these trends happening at the same time. The question is which will prevail and which would be the way forward. And of course, the other question we have to ask ourselves is what is the situation in Kerala? I remember joking once that in 1971, my illustrious predecessor of, as member of parliament for Thiruvananthapuram, Mr. V.K. Krishnamanan, conducted his entire election campaign in English, did not speak a word of Malayalam, and he won. I said if he tried that today, he would lose his deposit. Because that is, not only is it, is it that he would not have been understood by the vast majority of voters, but that they would have resented his not being able to speak Malayalam to them. That is essentially where we are in terms of cultural self-reassertion and cultural pride. And that has, as I said, political implications. But it's also true that the Keralite, more than perhaps any other Indian, with the possible exception of some of the Bombayites, the Mumbaikas, the Keralite is much more dependent upon being able to connect to the rest of the world. Partly it's a, ref a reflection of our own relative lack of job opportunities in this society. People need to go to other states, to other countries to look for work. Partly it's our own cultural openness which goes back for millennia I've just been to the Muziris excavations, the port which the Romans and the people of what we today think of as, uh, as West Asia, the Middle East, were trading with 3,000 years ago. Kerala has always been open across the Arabian Sea to the rest of the world. And therefore, one would argue that that openness predisposes us to being understanding of, tolerant of, other ways of seeing, other ways of believing, other ways of worshipping, other ways of dressing or eating, or even speaking. So Keralites can't afford to remain in a linguistic cocoon. Keralites, more than other states, whether for cultural reasons or for hard economic reasons, need to be able to interact with others. How well are we doing? I wonder what the answer to that is. I, I don't want to put Dr. Dutt on the spot. It would not be fair to do so. But there are many who have argued to me, and I'm referring to products of the University of Kerala, that English fluency in the University of Kerala is actually lower than it was 50 years ago. It may not be true in the English department, but it is true as a whole in the university. This is something which um, worries me. It worries me because at a time when Keralites who used to be famous for their fluency in other languages and their ability to adjust to and link to other people, at a time when Keralite should be able to take advantage of that heritage, they are losing that heritage and are becoming less equipped to cope with what the rest of the world requires from them. I remember when I first came back to Kerala and to Thiruvananthapuram after my UN career, 
I was given a grand reception at the Techno Park. I was not in politics or anything. Uh, um, and I said, all right, let me talk to all the CEOs in the Techno Park. And many of them were, were non Keralites. And I asked them what their experience was, particularly with their Kerala recruits. They were doing a lot of hiring from the University of Kerala, College of Engineering, other places in the city. And they said, we get very, very good students with excellent marks and good book knowledge. They can do the work, including on the computer, but they cannot speak. They said they are unable to relate to our clients, to our consumers, to our managers, because they have grown up in Kerala, essentially never speaking English or hearing the spoken language. And therefore, even though they can read a text, because they've studied it in school or college, they are unable to communicate fluently. That was, for me, a surprise and rather dismaying. And I remember, in a brief flush of enthusiasm, setting up a, a world-class communications academy to help uh, offer instruction. Then I got distracted into politics, and I gave all that up. But my thinking was precisely, why should that be? Of course, we've heard two or three people this morning speaking fluent English. Why can't more Keralites be able to do that? And the fact is that um, the fact is that the reason that Keralites can't do that is the other reasons I mentioned, which have become dominant uh, in our in our society, in our culture. I'm already getting calls to my next event, so I'm going to have to make it uh, fairly brief. But my larger concern to you all was that you are actually doing something which is rather important. Now, I agree that the study of literature is not the same as the study of language. Uh, but literature, in many ways, is the highest form of appreciating a language. It is being able to see the elasticity, the plasticity of words, of their meanings, of their nuances, of their contexts, uh, which is what, after all, literature evokes. It is not the same as studying the kind of English you need in the techno park. And yet, by being able to be comfortable with the language at that, at that, at that depth, you are actually equipping yourselves to be able to perhaps mark a revival of the English language in Kerala. I was intrigued that so many of you whom I asked why you're studying English have told me you want to be teachers. That's great. Teach others, inspire them to appreciate the advantages that we would have in this state by being able to speak and understand and relate to others in English. That, I think, is in many ways the best message I can, I can give you all today. Uh, I have very fond memories of, of uh, uh, one indirect association with this department, which is that 31 years ago, I believe it was, Dr. Ayyappa Panikar, who was then head of the department, uh, came and visited me and had dinner with me in Singapore, where I was heading the UN office at that time as a young man. And we talked about literature, and I was uh, hugely impressed meeting him. Sadly, um, we only met once or twice thereafter, and, and then, of course, he passed away so young. But um, the fact is that in this, in this uh, department, you've had some people of extremely high quality, and I hope that this department today is producing new scholars of, of comparable quality who will go on to be the Ayappa Panikars of the future. Congratulations on your 50 years. May this uh, Golden Jubilee uh, mark 50 new years of strength, revival, and glory for the English department. And let me thank you all once again for having invited me here to grace this occasion and to be part of what I hope will always be a celebration that many of you will, 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 will remember in the years to come. Thank you all and Jane.